This is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Tuesday, June 11th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Detective Headquarters Division, Field Investigation Section. The boss is Lieutenant Lavretovich. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. We had just completed the preliminary investigation on another senseless shooting. The victim died. Joe, where's the serial number on this Beretta? I forget. Look under the slide on the frame. Oh, yeah. Let me use your magnifying glass. 198483. They come in all sizes, don't they? That they do. The big one was designed to kill a 14-ounce bird. The little one, a 200-pound man. Kind of overreached this time, didn't it? Ted Wilkins weighed 211. The most of it muscle that supported four kids. How does a mother tell them their dad was gunned down for $51 and change? Righty, Gannon, hot shot. 1261 North Beverly, ambulance cutting. Reports are completed. These guns have to be booked into property. I'll handle it. Roll on the call. The location of the call was 10 minutes from the police building, 5.50 p.m. We arrived at 1261 North Beverly, the Brookfield Hotel. On your side? Right, what do we got here? Stabbing, elderly man. Looks like you and the coroner will have to finish up here. Yeah. Say, how's that Wilkins fellow doing? The shooting victim. He died. Stabbed in the upper left chest. Male, Caucasian, he looks about 75 years old. Name's Frank Bender. Any witnesses? The desk clerk might have something by now. He was so shook up when we got here, we couldn't get anything out of him. This man, Bender, does he live alone? As far as we know, yes, sir. I'll notify Prince Fotog in the coroner. Sarge, desk clerk's up to talking now. Name's Barnes, Ernie Barnes. Mr. Barnes, my name's Friday. I'm from detective headquarters. Now, did you see or hear anything that might help us? About 1.30 this afternoon, Frank came into the lobby. That's Frank Bender. Yes, he came into the lobby with this young fella. They sat around and talked for a while, and then he came here to Frank's room. Can you describe the younger fella? Well, he looked like he belonged in this area. Sort of all look alike. Average, you know. Yes, sir, I understand. But was there anything unusual about him? How about his hair, his clothing, his complexion? Well, the lobe of his right ear was gone. I saw that much. What about his clothing? Brown jacket, dark pants. I didn't pay much attention except for that ear. How old would you say he was? Late 30s. Like I said, a young fella. Yes, sir. What about his height and weight? Well, like I said, average. 5'10", about 160, 70 pounds. When did you see him last, Mr. Barnes? Not more than 20 minutes ago. He went running out of here like a flash. That's when I come down here to Frank's room and found him lying there on the floor. Yes, sir. All right, that'll be enough for the preliminary broadcast. Will you put it out and then dig up the beat man? Ask him if he remembers seeing a male cock around with a deformed right ear. Will do. All right, now, Mr. Barnes, let's talk about Frank Bender. What kind of a man was he? Do you have any idea why anybody might want to kill him? I've talked to Frank almost every night for 10 years. This job would have been pretty dull without his friendship. I'm going to miss him, officer. I'm really going to miss him. Yes, sir, we understand. Now, you try and take it easy. Yeah, I... Uh, I'm all right now. Did you ever see this man with a deformed ear before? Never. Never before. And he wasn't a friend of Frank's? Officer, everybody was Frank's friend. He was that kind of a person. He liked people. Well, now, did he usually take strangers to his room? Sometimes. But you have to know about Frank Bender to understand why he brought his friends to his room. All right, sir, suppose you tell us. He was so proud of his great-grandchildren, Eric and Mark. He had to bring people in and show them their pictures. You seen him in there, didn't you? 
Yes, sir, we saw them. Now, did Frank have anything in his room that this man would have killed him for? He lived on his Social Security. Didn't have nothing else. How much money do you think he had tonight? Well, let's see. This is June 11. The Social Security checks were mailed out on the 1st. He paid his rent, so that would leave him about $90. Did he have any other expenses that you know of? Only those two boys. How's that, sir? <laughs> He'd always buy them little things when he had a few extra bucks. Do you have any other relatives? Eleanor, that's his wife. She died 15 years ago, and his only child. The grandmother of Eric and Mark was killed in an auto accident about five years ago. All right, sir, do you have his granddaughter's address or phone number? Yes, sir, down at the desk. All right, sir, we'll pick it up on the way out. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Barnes. That's what I have a lot of time. Nobody to spend it with now. Seven fifty p.m. We completed the preliminary investigation of the Frank Bender homicide. Bill finalized the death report. I notified Irv Fowler in the press room. All right, now what's the info on this latest homicide? Twelve sixty-one North Beverly, room seven. The victim was Frank Bender, seventy-five years old. Lived there in the same place ten years. Stabbed in the chest. Any motive? Looks like robbery. Social security money. Suspects? Well, that was a one-man job. The beat man in the area has seen him a time or two. We have a pretty fair description. Well, this makes 162 murders so far this year. Yeah, we know that, Irv. What's your point? Point is, Joe, murder's so common in this country, it has to be an unusual case or a known name to make news. In other words, Frank Bender was a nobody, and the fact that somebody decides to snuff out his life for a few bucks means nothing. Come on, Joe, you know me better than that. All I'm saying is what good'll it do? Probably won't run it. He's gonna be another forgotten victim soon enough anyway, Irv. Maybe one person will remember him. Who's that? His killer. All right, I'll phone it in. Thanks, Irv. Yeah, sure. I doubt it'll get printed, but I'll phone it in. Sirs, my name is Will Banks. Will it Will Banks? I want to report a robbery. All right, sir, come right in. Just have a seat right here. Well, thank, thank you, sirs. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Sure was a long walk getting down here. Feels real good to sit. Yes, sir. Now, suppose you tell us about the robbery. They didn't get much. The amount doesn't matter. 76 cents. Joe, we can take the report instead of sending him down to Central. Well, now, was that all the money you had, Mr. Wilbanks? Yes, sir. I earned it selling bottles. I used to earn two or three dollars a day. But since they started to sell soft drinks and those no deposit, no return bottles, it's hard to earn much. Yes, sir. Well, now, just tell us what happened. I started on my regular route this morning, worked all day. It was real slow. I finished up with only 76 cents. Did you have any money when you started? No. I was able to buy my own dinner last night. It took all I had. Go on. You know the corner of Fifth and Temple? Yes, sir, we do. Well, I was tired and sat down against the wall and fell asleep. And when you woke up, your money was gone. That's right. Somebody robbed me. Where did you keep your money, Mr. Wilbanks? In this pocket. Well, do you suspect anyone in particular? There are a hundred guys down there that'd kill you for 76 cents. Not much for you to go on, I guess, but it's all I have. Well, Mr. Wilbanks, I need a little more information to finish this report. Sure. Ask me anything you want. Where do you live? I don't have a regular address. You know how it is. I have a brother back in Ohio who writes, so I check general delivery at the main post office. Well, we'll put down general delivery LA 90012. They know me down at the Union Rescue Mission. Yes, sir. We'll find you if we need you. Okay, sir, if you'll just sign here at the bottom. What part of the country do you come from, Mr. Wilbanks? Ohio. Came out here about 10 years ago. Any children? I left my wife and two kids in Ohio. She divorced me. The wife got remarried, and the boys seemed to have a nice home. Oh, I, I really blew it. Two years of college, a good job, and a wonderful family. How long you been on the wagon? About two months, count my last 30 days in jail. That's a good start. Yeah, but a little too late. All right, sir, we'll do what we can for you. Yeah, this is Friday, DHQ. I'd like a DR number on a theft from person report. The victim's name is Will Banks, Willard. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I got it. Thank you. 
Did you get the DR? Right here. 76 cents, drop in the bucket, with all he had in the world. Yeah, some drunk is probably enjoying the bottle of wine that it bought. I guess we don't realize how good we've got it sometimes, Joe. No, I guess not. Well, it's getting late, partner. What do you say we grab a bite to eat and then hit the field? No, I'll skip dinner tonight. I'm starting to diet. You're kidding, aren't you, pal? You passing up food? Oh, yeah, I've been putting on a little too much around the middle. Won't hurt to pass tonight. Kind of sudden, isn't it, you starting this diet? Well, you gotta start sometime. Will Banks, you gave him your dinner money, didn't you? Now, where in the world did you get an idea like that? Come on, let's get to work. p.m. we return to patrol. Eight fifteen p.m. we rolled on a purse snatch call close to our present location. An ambulance was already on the way. The victim had been taken from the street and brought to the home of a concerned resident, Mrs. Florence Bell. Oh, please come right in. She's right over here. Just look what they've done to that poor lady. Just look at her. Now, try to take it easy, ma'am. There's an ambulance on the way. She's in no condition to tell us anything. I wonder if we might step over here, ma'am. Surely. Now, it's important that we get a broadcast out right away so we can start looking for suspects. Did she tell you anything? She didn't have to. I saw the whole rotten thing. Do you want to tell me what you saw? Well, I was sitting by the front window just looking, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, I saw this poor woman walking along the sidewalk just minding her own business when these two hoodlums ran up behind her and tried to grab a purse. Can you describe them? Not too well. It was pretty dark. The best you can, ma'am. I'd say, judging from their builds and the way they ran, they couldn't have been more than 18, 19 years old. A couple of young hoodlums. About how tall, ma'am? Oh, I'd say about my height. One was black and the other was kind of a lanky white boy. Did you see a car? No, both of them were on foot. They were running off that way. That's eastbound. Yes, that's right. Could you see what they were wearing? Dark clothing, that's all I could see. Do you know this woman, Mrs. Bell? No, not to call her by name anyway. I see her every once in a while walking to the mailbox at the corner. She must live around here somewhere. I got her name, Katie Anderson. She's in pretty bad shape. All right, you want to put out the preliminary? Right. Now, Mrs. Bell, you mentioned that the two suspects tried to grab her purse. Did they get it? Oh, they got it all right, but not the first time. She fought him off good. The first time? Well, like I said, they ran up behind her like they were going to grab the purse and keep on running, you know? Yes, ma'am. But it didn't work. Poor thing hung on like it was a light. With both hands, she held that purse. They pulled on it so hard, it took her right to the ground. Both of them pulled on the purse and dragged her down the sidewalk about 20 feet. She just hung on, Sergeant. Hung on like she'd never let go. That's when I ran outside. Go ahead, please. I told them I had a gun and would blow their fool heads off. You know what they did? Just cursed and laughed at me. Did you have a gun, ma'am? Of course not. I don't believe in them. But I did grab a stick and took out after them. Now, is that when they ran? No. Not until they kicked this poor woman in the head to make her let go of the purse. <laughs> they kicked her hard, Sergeant. It's a wonder she's alive. What happened then? That was it. They got the purse and ran off down the street. I brought her into my house and called the ambulance. A few minutes later, you got here. Three Adam 27 got the call. Should be here in a few minutes. Right. How many units in the area? Three uniform sergeants coordinating the search. How's the woman doing? I'd say fair. The suspects kick her in the head. Yeah, she told me. What is it this time, robbery? Yeah, that's right. We haven't stopped since 4.30. I guess it's the full moon tonight. Yeah. Full moon. Always seems to increase the action. Okay, lady. Take it easy. We'll get you fixed up right away. Joe, Bill, that's our victim, huh? You can get her statement later at Central Receiving. Mrs. Bell over there is your best witness. Right. Get the report book. I'll talk to her. You guys detectives? That's right, DHQ Nightwatch. Yeah, I gotta get into that. These radio calls are driving me out of my mind. Investigation, that's for me. How long you been on the job? Six months now, but I've got this patrol thing pretty well whipped. I'm ready to move into something else now, you know? Uh-huh, six months. That means you just got out of the academy last month, is that right? Yeah, that's right. You know, it takes a good investigator to do a decent job working a radio car. Yeah, but it's all preliminary. I wanna get into follow-up. That's where you get the big capers. That's a new one on me, son. Here all the time, I was under the impression that patrol officers were always in on the big capers. Here's an example. Look at us. Somebody gets their purse stolen, and who gets it? Us. It's getting so routine, I'm bored half stiff. Rather be out tracking down a bank robber, huh? That's the ticket. None of this old lady drops her purse jazz. Let me tell you something, youngster. Someday, when you get the backs of those ears dried out, you might wake up and see how important your job really is. Take a look at your partner over there. 16 years in a patrol unit, one of the best on the job. Now, apparently, you haven't been listening to him, or you don't want to. 
For your information, that little old lady didn't just get her purse stolen. It was robbery. Two hoodlums kicked her senseless out there on that sidewalk. You got a real large problem, son. You worry more about yourself than what goes on around you. Do me a favor, will you? Sit back and take a real hard look. Look at the victims of these crimes and try to have a little empathy. It might do you some good. That's what we're all here for, to serve these people. Now, if you can't see it that way, maybe you better look for some other kind of job. I'm sure the department can spare you. I didn't mean to. That's right. You don't know what you mean or what you say or how you impress other people. Now, you think about it. Try to learn something from your partner. He'll teach you if you listen. He understands his job. You don't. Now, do me a small favor, will you? What's that, sir? Do what your partner told you to do. Go out there and get that book, then get back in here and go to school. Yes, sir. Green recruit, partner. Kind of hard on him, weren't you? Those two punks were kind of hard on Mrs. Anderson. After leaving the residence of Mrs. Florence Bell, we checked on the progress of the search for the suspects and Katie Anderson's purse. The patrol officers had reached a dead end. 8.45 p.m., we returned to Parker Center to catch up with our paperwork. Joe, we got a murder suspect in that hotel stabbing. Good work. How'd you dig him up? As soon as you cut us loose from the hotel, we started hitting every bar on the beat. Between radio calls, that is. Divisional detectives are doing the same. But you found him first. Yeah, but I can't really chalk it up to good police work. Mills and I must be living right. How's that? We were just getting ready to check this bar. You know, the round rows where most of the hoodlums hang? Yeah. Well, we got a radio call, family dispute. One of the hotels there on East Fifth. So we had to drop checking the bar and handle the call. He was part of the family dispute? We sure must be living right. No, we handled the call, and on the way out, there he was. Where? In the hotel lobby, sitting there large as life. I spotted that deformed ear, and we took him. That's when we called divisional detectives. Did he live at that hotel? No, he just dropped in to rent a room for the night. Like you said, pal, you and Mills live right. What's your status? We're clear, Lieutenant. 211 shooting, 3rd and Central. Roll on it. Nine thirty p.m., we arrived at the scene of the robbery concurrent with the district radio car. It was a small grocery store. The uniformed officers would maintain intensive patrol in the area while we obtained preliminary broadcast information. Get him an ambulance, will you? Get Julio an ambulance. Yes, sir, there's one on the way. Now, I've got to get a broadcast out here. Do you feel up to answering some questions for me? Yes, yes. All right, fine. How many suspects were there? One. Male? Caucasian? Male. Caucasian. How old would you say? About 25. How about height and weight? Uh, six feet, 180 pounds. How was he dressed? Uh, red shirt, dark pants. Was he wearing a hat? No. All right, what kind of a gun did he have? A gun, just a gun. All right, sir, now try to take it easy. What kind of a gun? Was it a handgun, a rifle, a shotgun? A uh, handgun. Blue steel or chrome? Uh, blue steel. Okay. Anything particularly unusual about him? Yeah, you see the blood on the floor over there? Yeah. It's his. His face is cut up pretty bad on the left side. Okay, Art, will you get the preliminary out? Roger. What can I do, Sergeant? See if that ambulance crew can use any help. Preserve that evidence by the door. Right. Watch that physical evidence there. <laughs> All right, sir, we can go a little easier now. How's that arm? Oh, it'll be all right. I'm worried about Julio there. What's his full name? Julio Romano. That's his wife, Eva. They own this place. Been here for 32 years. And your name, sir? Tim Walker. I live just around the corner. Came in to get some Italian sausage. And this. All right, sir, now can we start at the beginning? Uh, not much to tell. We were just standing around talking when this guy comes in. He walks over to the dairy case and gets some milk. You didn't see the gun at that time? No, it must have been under his shirt. Then he walks over to the counter and asks Julio how much the milk is. Julio tells him, and he says, OK, give me all your money. That's when I look up, and he's got this gun pushed into Julio's stomach. Yes, sir. And then what? Julio did exactly as he told him, emptied all the money into a sack and gave it to him. And the guy starts out the door and told us not to move. What started the shooting? Oh, that's the sick part. When he started for the door, Julio begged him not to take it all. He told this guy he had bills to pay, you know? Yes, sir, go ahead. Well, the creep turns around and says, Oh, that's too bad. Let me help you pay him. And then he points the gun at Julio and shoots him. Three times he fired. Is that when you got hit? No. I grabbed a wine bottle from the barrel here and threw it at him. Hit him in the face. 
He fired once more at me and ran out the door. That's when you were hit? Yeah, but nothing compared to Julio there. How is he? It'll be touch and go. Let's get you in the ambulance now. Better ride in with him. Maybe he can tell us something. Right. Okay, the broadcast's out. We've established a 15-block perimeter. Got anything else to go on? Nothing but that trail of blood spots there. Yeah, we're on that already. Okay, break out the map. We'll cover every square inch of the area and mark it off. Green, you handle that until your sergeant gets here. Right. Now, the rest of you start covering the area on foot. Myler, you can stay with me for a while. Yes, sir. Do you want me to phone downtown? Right. I want latent prints, photos, crime lab, and division detectives down here on the double. Then we'll start going over this place like a vacuum cleaner. You can start penciling the robbery report out. Yes, sir. Myler. Yes, sir? You'd probably rather be out there hunting down that suspect, wouldn't you? Yes, sir, I probably would. But this is important, too. Ten ten p.m., division detectives and patrol supervisors took over the crime scene search. I followed up at Central Receiving Hospital. The suspect had not been found. Any luck finding the guy? No, sir, not yet. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm all right. But what are those two old people going to do? Eva can't run the store by herself. No telling how long Julio's going to be laid up. How is he? He's still in the treatment room. We haven't got a report from the doctor yet. Mrs. Romano asked for a priest. That's him. That's him. They got the guy. Found him hiding in a parked car six blocks from the store. Dumb luck, cop. I would have killed you if I had half a chance. You didn't get half a chance, did you, friend? I'll see you in court, Fuzz. It ain't over yet. Not by a long shot. You advise him yet? Now, I figured you might like to talk to him. Yeah, let's move down here. What do they bring him here for? To get treatment for that cut on his face. Then he'll be booked. OK, I want you to listen to your rights. Come on, turn around, fellow. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge before questioning. Now, do you understand these rights I've explained to you? Yeah. What's he doing? We advise all suspects of their rights before any questioning. Oh, that's a Supreme Court thing. Yes, sir, that's right. <laughs> Sure is a great world, isn't it, Sergeant? Sir? That two-bit thief gets his rights, and Julio gets his last ones. <laughs> the story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 20th and September 4th, separate trials were held in Department 50, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of those trials. The suspects were found guilty of murder perpetrated during the commission of robbery, which is murder in the first degree. Murder in the first degree is punishable by death or confinement in the state prison for life.